because if it didn't sound like dystopian technology, then it wouldn't be a podcast. This is how we're going <laughs> to communicate in the dark times is through podcasts. So, I don't. How does one even start a podcast? I don't, I don't know. know. <laughs> this is, yeah, this is definitely a new thing. <laughs> I want to be, like, authentic, but I'm, like, I'm so judging myself for how I talk now. <laughs> no, do not judge yourself. I was thinking to myself when we decided that we were going to do this, I was like, well, you know, I have, I've been told I have a voice for podcast, that I have a nice podcast voice, which I kind of think of as, like, when people say you have a face for radio, where it's like, mm. you're, you're really nice to listen to, but I don't want to look at you. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's that's been my calling. But then I was like, well, Maddie also has... A very cute adorable voice so it'll be Aww. like this good because i have a very like low voice for a woman <laughs> to be honest so we have a good nice contrast i feel like no one's gonna get us confused that's true i never know the difference between who's speaking on the babysitter's club club I'm always <laughs> like i'm pretty sure that's yeah. especially too because you know we have our we have our different accents we're from yeah. we're representing different places which is good because in a way it, it represents um the the nationality of the creators as well to a degree you <laughs> with your your british kiwi sound contrasted <laughs> with my american sound is very much what people can imagine it sounds like when esther and i talk to each other because she's bringing british and i'm bringing authentic american as you guys <laughs> have called it yes authentic you are you are so i i don't know because it's not like a, affected in any way i mean <laughs> it's just flat it's just flat american like if people want to imitate an, an american they should listen to you <laughs> i don't know if that's a compliment or <laughs> like an insult but i'll take it <laughs> um so yeah i whatever we just recorded i'm gonna definitely keep in there because it's cool but maybe that won't be the start maybe i'll move it around but um hello to everybody Hi. that's gonna listen to this Hi. At some point in the future. Um, I'm Maggie. Oh, and I'm Maddie. <laughs> and this is Ambition Unpacked, the first, the very first episode of Whoop. Ambition Unpacked. Whoop. Um, so basically I thought, you know, you know, to preface to the people that will hear this one day, um, this is our first this is Maddie and I's first podcast. Um, so if we sound like we don't know what we're doing, it's because we don't. But that's okay, because we're going to figure it out as we go. We definitely, it's kind of fun that we're doing this, because I feel like we've talked a lot about like, oh, we'll do this idea, we can do this podcast, we could talk about this and this and this, because we just like to mm -hmm. talk about things mm -hmm. with each other. Um, so it's cool that we're actually doing it now. Yeah, look at us go. We just, we just finally got on board and did it. I think we've been thinking about <laughs> yeah. doing something like this. Yeah, we pulled it together in like, what, like three days? We were like, yeah. well... Here's as we'll talk about this more when we talk about what this podcast is going to be. But part of the reason that we weren't going to do this is because originally we had we do a lot of things where we talk about, oh, let's do this idea. Let's do this idea. Um, but with this one, it was like because of the way ambition is, we were going to wait until the show ended and it was going to be a like, let's go back and like look mm -hmm. at it. But then I got too excited and I was like torn <laughs> with myself because I was like, I really want to start digging into it and just like talk about things and get into it. But I also was like, I don't want to spoil things or like kind of have to keep myself from talking. But then when we were discussing it, we kind of came up with this idea of like, well, when the show ends, we can do a retroactive like season one episode where we can go back and talk about all the things that I couldn't necessarily talk about. And we also realized, I think that it, it's going to take a, really long time to do this podcast if there's you know what's gonna be like approximately 70 episodes of ambition by the time this is done no that's not including cruel summer that's not including mm -hmm. any fun bonus episodes we want to do so if we want to not be in our 30s when we're <laughs> going through season five you know that would be it's you know what's wrong with starting now it's just jumping into it so nothing wrong with it I mean, and I'm sure we'll we'll actually just run out of things um, sooner than we think even, like, I mean, yeah. a couple of years, but still. <laughs> <laughs> it's still, it's so long, you know? That's the crazy yeah. thing is that the show has even been going on for three years already. Can you believe that? Oh, I cannot. 
That it's weird. It's crazy. So I guess a little bit we can start with um, just kind of talking about ourselves and why we're doing this and how we were connected. So t- cool. tell me, tell the tell the people a little bit about yourself, Miss Maddie. Okay. Uh, well, I am Maddie. I. <laughs> what do I say? What do you say about yourself? Um, I live in New Zealand um, for one, which is. Which Just is very cool. A fun, interesting fact to some. I found, found ambition, I guess, uh, mm-hmm. through, yeah, my sister sent me a link to a working sort of idea that was <laughs> pre-ambition. And I felt like this was going to be great. And I checked back every single day until it posted and yeah I work in design what else do I say I'm I'm not (laughs) there's nothing too special I'm not a podcast expert but I do like listening to podcasts so hopefully I can bring that uh experience of listening to recap podcasts to this yeah no that's true I think too um one of the reasons I'm excited to to get into this with you is because Maddie kind of has this reputation in our group chat that we have she's kind of known as the master theorist like I think you pick up on threads really well and you notice things in episodes (laughs) that Esther and I want people to notice and it's always exciting when people start to like put little things together that we've been planting because this sounds pretentious to say but everything we do is intentional like there's we plant things so far ahead that we have like been building towards all these themes and it's always nice to see people pick up on those little hints like when you're reading episodes from say season three we we know what's going to happen you know like we know it's coming but to see you guys start to either like think about a plot line like you get Mm -hmm. the storyline right and you're on the right track or you kind of notice uh one example i have is one of our friends sunny she noticed for this is a spoiler um if you haven't been in season three yet i think most people that listen to this will have read it but Mm -hmm. um there's in an episode i think it's season three episode seven there's a little transition between scenes where it's riley and lucas talking to each other about his essay that he wrote and they have a very sweet moment and then there's a pre-lap um which for people who don't know i can talk about some writing stuff too there's a Mm pre-lap means like the dialogue is over the scene before and it doesn't transition yet but it's coming from the next scene so there's a pre-lap of dialogue that billy the haverford boy says where he's like they're talking about charlie and they go, I knew he wasn't trustworthy or whatever. Like, I knew we couldn't trust him. Something like that. And the fact that it is intentionally pre-lapped over that scene of Riley and Lucas, it was intentional because it was kind of hinting at that storyline of what's going to happen with Missy. Um, mm. And Sunny caught on to that. She was like, this makes me kind of nervous. I don't, I don't like, and I was like, yes, it should be making you nervous because it's very intentional that we did that Um, so subtle so just (laughs) to see you guys pick up on stuff like that is like really cool and that's I think you're quite good at that so I'm excited to to talk about all of it we're gonna do all of it thank you I mean that's a compliment I don't know I feel like I started in season one being very master theorist and now I just kind of roll with it a bit more because I'm like I never know what's gonna happen well, it's, it's, I think it's good to have a, a balance where you're like, oh, I, I think I see what, like, you can't predict everything, but I think you generally kind of get where, where the direction that things are going. But there yes. are, of course, storylines yeah. where people have no idea what's happening, um, and we'll get to talk about all of those. Yeah. But yeah, um, a, a thing that um, brought us together was, that's kind of the crazy thing is that ambition was what brought us together. We would yes. not have met or become friends, or even known the other person existed on the opposite side of the globe Mm -hmm. if it wasn't for this fake TV show. And I think that that, to me, has been the really coolest thing about this experience, has been seeing just how much it has brought people together, and I've made a lot of friends through it, and it has, you know, like this little fandom community that really cares about it, and it is so into it. And that's been cool, because Esther and I, when we first started this, we really were just like, we'll just put it out there and it's for us. And if people like it, great. And if they don't, we just keep writing it because we just want to have fun with it. Um, and so the feedback that we got, even just in the first season, was like 
wow, this is kind of crazy. Oh. This is cool. Yeah. And, and now we're here. here. We are. <laughs> it's really quite profound. Not to like overhype it or overstate, <laughs> but ambition changes lives. <laughs> It, it's yeah I mean the the kind of the thing that I always tell myself is that people who are meant to find ambition will find it and Ooh. it will they will come to it and it will bring people together if they're meant to um but that's why I always say you know um if you think you have a friend who would like the story share it with them because it has brought many different kinds of people into this little place we really are just a bunch of oddballs and misfits hanging out just like the cast of Ambition. Yeah. I guess we can talk a little bit like what we think this podcast is going to be like, what we want to accomplish, what are our, our goals and our dreams. So I guess maybe should I talk about who I am? I mean, you haven't really described yourself. I, I feel like I didn't do that. <laughs> no, yeah, that's, I maybe should. Um, so I am one of the co-creators of Ambition. Um, and in this episode, we will talk a little bit about how Ambition even came to be. And I'll talk a little bit about my co-creator, Esther, and our dynamic. Um, But I am a writer. Uh, I went to school for screenwriting, but I've done a lot of prose writing. I'm I'm basically kind of at this point in my life into um, more novel writing, but ambition is kind of this cool little in-between space for me where it's it's a little bit of both. It, It thinks very cinematically, and when you think about it, it's supposed to be thought of as a show, but it's very easy to write. It's not quite the same as writing a script with all of its rules. Generally, I'm just, uh, it, you, I think it would not surprise people to learn that I'm a, I was a resident assistant in college, which is, for those who don't know and don't have it in their country or their culture, it's basically at college in the dorms, there is basically like an older sibling who is the knowledgeable, in theory, wise one who is keeping you from messing up your life and you can go to for <laughs> advice. And I, I think of that role as an RA kind of it kind of sums me up well because I I'd like to have that relationship with people. I like to be a mentor. I like to bring people together. And that's why it's been very exciting that Ambition has brought people together just kind of in its own magical way. I also definitely have a background in music and theater. And I'm sure no one is surprised to learn I was a theater kid. <laughs> so all of that plays, you know, into Ambition, the communication angle, the writing angle, the theater angle always comes together to create, I think, the the elements that exist in the show so yeah I think it's really interesting that um like you're you're so into musical theater and like music and scores and I I would say I'm I've always been into it like I go to see things and I've been in productions but I don't really like go out of my way to listen to it Mm -hmm. so that is uh, something interesting about ambition is bringing bringing the musical theater to people who might not necessarily listen to it otherwise. No, that's you're completely right. Um, that's one of my favorite things about it is so I don't know if uh, people out there have listened to there's another ambition podcast um, that's kind of on hiatus right now, but a couple of our friends uh, Emma and Hanny have made this podcast called A Cup of Ambition, which is a great name, and I'm mad that they stole that name first. Basically, they are much more humorous, yeah. I think, than ours is going to be a little more geared towards. Um, ours is going to be a little more analytical and unpacking things because it's called Ambition Unpacked. <laughs> um, but they both are not musical theater people at all. Like, they very much are like, when I start talking about it, they're like, okay, Maggie, shut up. Their only one that they like they used to like is um, Phantom of the Opera, which I hate. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that, I'm sure. But they, too, were like, I hate musical theater. I don't want to blah, blah, blah. And then when they started their recap one, they did a thing of like, okay, I will actually listen to the music as we reread. And it's been very vindicating actually, because I am so much a staunch person. I'm like to truly get the ambition experience, listen to the music. It doesn't necessarily have to be like in the moment when you're reading it, but it just elevates it. It's just one of the special things about the project that makes it different. And I think that when people Mm -hmm. Every person that I have had this conversation with, when they actually do it, they have confirmed that the music really does make a difference. Mm-hmm. And when you listen to it, it elevates the reading experience. So it's been cool to see how, yeah, how music, us including it in the show, both adds something to the show, but also is this cool way to like share all these different types of music. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, 
You got me into Glass Animals and that's not even um, musical theatre. It's just a g- great band. Mm-hmm. Yep. Agnes, exactly. amazing, amazing performance. Um, that's kind of my, I'll pose the question to you, Maddie, as a challenge mm-hmm. in this. I know that you, you typically do listen to the music, but there are times where you don't. Mm-hmm. So do you think in this reread, are you going to do the same thing? Are you going to challenge yourself to like really listen to the music? Yes. Yeah. My situation with listening to the music is in season one, I would often read the episodes while I was at the gym because I had to force myself to go. <laughs> and so I needed something. Um, and often you, you would post them while I was at work and then I would go after work and I was like, I need to read it right now, even though I'm on this bicycle machine thing. And so I didn't have the music, but then season two, I just, I didn't have much going on. I was just hanging out. But yeah, season three has been up and down. Mm-hmm. So I think I definitely enjoy it. I do have to force myself to listen to some of the musical theater. But then, you know, sometimes it's like, I, I one thing that I thought was very vindicating too is there's a song in, I think it's 315, where they it's the opening, it's opening a new world, mm-hmm. which is a super, super small, like niche Jason Robert Brown musical. Um, mm-hmm. And like, I would not expect anyone to know that song. It was not, like, offensive that no one knew what that song was. But literally every person that listened to it, I think including you, were like, oh, this is really good. Like, this is kind of a bop. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> so wow. it'll be cool to, to to reevaluate all the music that we've had so far. And, Definitely. And I would and see what's I'm a bop. excited to listen to <laughs> season one songs again because it has been a while now. Yes, it has been very long. And that'll be interesting, too, because I think um, in season one, it, it, it'll be funny to talk about the first few episodes of season one because I think you know this about me but I'm kind of like I was I was just putting it out there in season one I was not going super hard about mm-hmm. anything and I think that you can see it feels a little less intentional in the music choice in season mm-hmm. one like Esther and I even retroactively have had we've changed some songs mm-hmm. so we'll talk about that when we come across them but yes. Whereas, like, now it's, like, we're so, when we're outlining and we're writing, we're so particular about the song choice. Like, we we go into debates about it. We're, like, it needs to be perfect. Whereas, first half of season one was not like that at all. Mm-hmm. So, it'll be kind of fun to see, like, would I even have still chosen that song today? Yeah. Or does it really add anything? Yeah. Plus the fact that, like, you know, the part of the reason episodes are so long now is because the music is, like, we when we write about performances, we've got it in our mm-hmm. heads. We're, like, this, let's take it step by step. Look at this visual thing. Whereas, like, Season one, like performances, is like here's one line about it. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. Because like, you guys were so different. We were trying to get season one sort of out of the way in a way because you were ready for season two yeah. already, right? No, yeah, that's true. It was kind of like we, I guess you know we can kind of transition a little bit into how ambition came mm-hmm. to be, um, and we can talk during that as well about what ambition even is. I guess we can start with that. What the hell is ambition? Um, so it for those who might be listening to this who don't know what it is, which would be would an interesting be, choice. But okay, like, welcome. Welcome. Um, <laughs> so Ambition is a, it's like a musical dramedy, a high school drama, but it is a fan fiction, but it is written like a TV show, and it's not really a fan fiction in the sense that it really does not rely on its source material at all. And that is something that I think is, this is a good place to, to talk about that a little bit from the creator perspective. Mm-hmm is that weird space that it occupies it to me and esther when we started it we i mean this was we started this in 2019 and it was like you know girl meets world had ended girl meets world it was the original source material <laughs> for anyone who did not know Shocked. and it ended in 2017 so you know it had been a couple of years like this is not a hip and happening fandom and i think that it's kind of interesting because the show itself like esther and i i think just really like the characters and thought they were really fun and i think to his credit michael jacobs is very good at creating characters and so we just like really enjoyed playing around with them but i think that in a way ambition could have come from any show the true thing that brought it to light is the friendship of esther and i and kind of our combined writing sensibilities that we ended up writing in theory a show together um and you know as we talk about how it developed like you'll see like so much of it has changed. I think if someone, I mean, we have readers who have never seen an episode of Meets World in their life. And I think that you don't need to have no. seen. It has a little bit of enriched understanding of certain things, especially in the first season, yeah. because that was when it was still very much a fan fiction and we were just having fun with it. So we'd throw little Easter eggs in, you know, like 
the fact that the school that Lucas is considering transferring to in season one is called McAuliffe, which was the last name of their rival in Girl Meets Text. I mean, like little stuff like that. Yeah, honestly, I didn't even I didn't even know that. Honestly, I don't remember. Yeah, and it's like <laughs> that's stuff that like does not it negatively impact your reading experience at all if you don't pick up on it. But if you were someone who like you know was pretty into Girl Meets World, then you can see these little little hints, little Easter eggs in a way of like, we were throwing these things in. And this idea too, that I think in when we first were outlining the first three seasons, a lot of characters are kind of based on very thin sketches of people who appeared in the show. Like the Haverford boys, like Dweezil, Brandon, and Billy, those were all individual characters in the show at one point. But we obviously took just this idea of them and we're like, let's completely build on this and make it something totally different basically like that's kind of the stuff that you'd see in the earlier parts and that's kind of the little i think pieces that remain of the connection to girl Meets world aside from the character names that are the same but it to esther and i mm-hmm. i think has become totally its own entity like it feels so distinct like when we joke about like au's and stuff like that we've we've made a lot mm-hmm. of ambition au's in our group chat maybe we'll have an episode we about should. that someday but <laughs> <laughs> there's so many but those are always ambition AUs you know they're not girl meets world yeah. AUs so it's like this kind of thing of it's such a separate thing in our heads and I think yes. you know we obviously know like we're not going to try and profit off of it we know what its origins are we know it is a fan fiction but very loosely and I think that that's something that we kind of like to to put out there for people that are consuming it is okay. a it's a pro of like if you have a friend that you think would like it but knows nothing about girl meets world it's like, it's okay. Like, you don't, you don't need to know anything. Come in, it's a new show, new slate, just enjoy it. But then the other, I think, side to that double-edged sword is like, we know this is what it is. And it's always going to be kind of locked in on this level of it was a fan fiction, but that's okay. You know, I think one thing that we really like about it is the fact that for two people that want to be writers in our own respects, it is so nice to have a project that it's like, we can do whatever the hell we want because it's not (laughs) real. So (laughs) we can have you know, Nicole Scherzinger come guest star and not have to pay her a million dollars because <laughs> it's not real. You know what? I think she would be into it. I honestly don't even think she would ask for that big of a pay. Like, I <laughs> I feel like, you know, she started out in theater. So she'd be, yeah. she'd be well into it. It's funny that we, we joke about the fact that we can do whatever we want, but then we try to be really realistic <laughs> about stuff like that. Like, we don't try to cast, like, too big a names who would, like, never be in the show. Or, like, we think about, like, when we have cameos, it's like, would this person be down? Like, do we think they'd actually be cool to cameo in a show where this is theoretically a big show? Um, so it's been, it's funny that we kind of are like, we can do whatever we want, but then we still play by these kind of realism rules of like, well, who would actually <laughs> be willing to do this role? But yeah, so that um, big segue about what the Hell Ambition is, but how did it come to be? So basically, Esther and I have been friends gosh it's been so long probably since about 2016 i would say Um, i know right it's really crazy um 2016 or 2017 that we'd been friends and we kind of were like in each other's periphery for a while she would like send me messages on tumblr like you know we'd have those kind of conversations and then i think we became better friends when i had sent her one of my original shows um called travelers and so she was reading it and our friend hanny was reading it we were all in a group chat together but we would still occasionally like you know talk about girlmates world stuff because that was the fandom that connected us originally we also had had a couple of false starts in the past where we'd like come up with this idea for an au and then we're really excited about it for a couple days and then where whereas this one is so interesting that (laughs) it's still going um we definitely i had to get this far but it's really cool that we have um but basically esther came into our group chat with hanny and she was like i've been re-watching victorious <laughs> and i was thinking it'd be so fun if we did like a girl meets world victorious au almost to start you, you hadn't seen victorious had you i still have not it's seen like, victorious so that was like <laughs> to me i would also have just been like yes let's go because that was like my favorite <laughs> show <laughs> yeah yeah, I just, to me, I was into it because I love music and I love musical theater. Mm-hmm. So I was like, yeah, sure. It's kind of similar to a, a long time ago, I had made a gift set for a Glee AU. And I was like, it's kind of, it's kind of the same. Um, so we kind of just jumped into that with those ideas. And we had, I think for like 
basically because we we have a huge time zone between us for those that don't know us is in the uk and i'm on different coasts of the u.s at different times um so we would have between five to eight hour time difference that we're working with and so for that first time though we had an eight hour time difference and it was basically like every time we were awake huh. we just kept talking about this for like 48 hours straight Aww. and we were just brainstorming like all these ideas and it's really funny because basically every single rule that we had set for ourselves originally of what this would be has been broken like one of the rules was like oh it's gonna be more like a comedy like it's gonna be like a sitcom mm-hmm. like victorious like we were like that's what it originally be that's definitely not true no. um because these episodes are very long <laughs> and they're very dramatic maybe at like times. the first three episodes <laughs> <laughs> yeah right you can kind of see a little bit of that early on um and the biggest one that i think is so funny was that we were like this isn't going to be like Glee where people just randomly burst into song. It's going to be like into like in the universe. It's very clear that they're mm-hmm. singing, which is like what Victorious is like more so. Um, and that's just hilarious because as we know, <laughs> it is very much <laughs> like Glee now where people just burst into song and we have people hallucinating things while they're singing. So not that what we originally <laughs> thought it was going to be. Um, so we were just like, we had all these ideas of what it was and those completely changed as we were talking over, I'd say about a week was the first kind of big conversation about it, but I don't think it it really gelled until we had kind of set up these ideas of like, what are these characters like? What are they going to be? It's funny too, because originally Maya Mm -hmm. was going to be like a kind, like a kind of Jade, like she was going to be like punk rock, like (sighs) gothic, like so different to what she is now where she's the the prep diva basically um oh. and so there's all these things we were playing with all these different character ideas but it really came together when i think as we were discussing what are the things that these characters would be facing we knew from the beginning like oh like lucas and Issa would be best friends because they'd be techies and they'd be in that space together um none of the very dark backstory for both of them had been <laughs> <laughs> developed at that point i think we had ideas but we hadn't really thought about it much because we were still on this thing of, oh, it's like a comedy, which we would not really delve into those things if it was a comedy. Um, yeah, I mean, but maybe. <laughs> like, you know, the best Certain comedies, elements, right? maybe. Yeah. I just think the best comedies have a little tragedy in them. That's true. That's true. That's insightful. You're right. It's just my TV addict brain for you. Right. <laughs> Your how many hours of TV last year did you watch? I don't want to remember. How many was it? It was probably like... I did actually have the number, but it's fine. It's all, it's all good. We don't need it. Had it had to be like 1,200 or something. But yeah, it was definitely. I think it was something like that. But yeah, so we had gotten to this point where it was like both of us had this idea about Farkle and we didn't, because the moment we said this out loud, it was going to completely change everything. And we Ooh. both knew that. And I think we also, it was this fragile thing of like a new partnership where you're actually really being creative. You don't want to say something. Mm-hmm that's going to completely like derail that. So we were both kind of hesitant about it, but then I just kept having such a clear vision of this storyline. Yeah. And so I said to S one day I broke, I was like, okay, so you can totally say you don't want to do this. Like we do not have to go down this road, but I feel like Farkle would try to commit suicide. And Esther said, like, I have been thinking the exact same thing, but I didn't want to say it because I didn't want to make you like uncomfortable. But both of us were like, no, like that is it. Like that is what this has been building Ooh. towards. And that plot line, for spoiler, I guess, spoiler alert <laughs> if you haven't read it, but that plot line, which as you guys know, is mid season two. Like it's not in the beginning, but we knew that's what we were building towards. And so everything that we did from that point on building towards season two was moving towards that point that was this kind of flashpoint for us was like this is what's at the core of this is why Mm -hmm. is someone driven to this how does you know mental health and arts and the passion of art but the struggle of it Mm -hmm. like how does all that intersect and it just kind of came together in that moment of both of us being like if we both had this thought and we were afraid to say it but now we've said it Mm -hmm. and it's like bam that's it we need to follow that and that was kind of, I think, when everything changed. Because after that, it's like, okay, if we're going to have, like, a suicide attempt, mm. we can do whatever mm-hmm. we want. Like, this is no longer a comedy <laughs> to a degree. This is more of a dramedy. So after that, it really just kind of developed. And I think we outlined pretty roughly the first three seasons in about the first month of talking about it. Just, wow. like, kind of getting all these ideas out in the wall. And I remember that because we were talking about this in like March 2019. You guys know the first season came out end of it was April 30th mm-hmm. 2019 was the premiere. 
And I can remember when I was first, I was in an internship at the time. I was still in school. It was my last semester of school. And I can remember in about April 2019, driving back from my internship on my commute, listening to Beauty and the Beast, Mm. because we had talked about this will be the season three musical. So I was listening to Beauty and the Beast and Be Our Guest and me and like all the songs picturing what is now in 309. So it's been so long. Like we've had so many of these ideas basically since the first couple weeks of like figuring this stuff out and then it's become so much better and like we've improved so much and everything's become really deep but a lot of the first shell rough sketches is there and has been since the first couple weeks that we were working on yeah and you guys really I mean it makes it all much better but like it also means you guys kind of played yourselves because it means you just have so much (laughs) in your head that you can't talk about whereas we're just all experiencing it as it comes Yes. And you, you know, I struggle with that Mm -hmm. because I really want to, if we're having like a really good conversation about like somebody's motivations or like, Mm -hmm. what are they doing? Where are they headed? And I'm always really want to contribute like a thought, but it's like, this is something that has to be earned. Like we have to get there Mm -hmm. to really talk about this, but no, it's true. And that's been interesting working on season four as well as season one through three kind of came together. The basic building blocks of it came together pretty easily in those first, that first month or so. So now season four, it's like we have ideas of where we want them to go. We know what their endpoints are for season five, but it has been kind of like going back to the drawing board a little bit because the the structure of AAA is gone now. Mm -hmm. And now it's like we know where we want them to end up. How are we going to get there? And that's been kind of fun to almost like have to go back to the roots in a real way rather than building on the pieces we'd already dug up two years ago, you know? That's so fun. That would be a really good... So it'll be fun to talk about that yeah <laughs> at some point oh, I mean we have endless hours although I think in respect to our listeners we should probably keep it to not a, not an infinity amount of hours <laughs> the the podcast episodes are longer than the the show yeah. can you imagine that would be that'd be rough I mean we've talked a little bit about some of the episodes in the later seasons might be two-part podcast episodes because they're so long and there's so much to talk about. Yes, and it takes but... me so long to read them. It notoriously <laughs> takes me yes, and we're, extremely long time. We're planning to, to kind of talk about what we want the structure of this to be. Mm-hmm. Like It is going to be, for the most part, a recap podcast where we're going to both reread the episodes and listen to the music and write down notes for ourselves about things we want to talk about. But the kind of cool thing about it, since you have a creator sitting in here (laughs) in the group chat with you, is we're basically going to be really unpacking certain elements as we move forward. Like we'll talk about what was the behind the scenes of creating this storyline? Why did we do this? And that's why it's great that that Maddie is the one doing this with me because she is very good with keen questions. Like she's mm-hmm. really good at figuring out like how can we unpack this further. Um, and she like I have such a fond memory of I think the first year that our group chat existed, which was right after season one, when we were waiting for season two, you had created this document <laughs> that was like 100 questions for ambition season That's two right. or something like that. That was just like all of these things like is this gonna happen could this happen what do we think and it's like I loved that I was like this is so fun (laughs) (laughs) and that's the energy that I think I'm hoping we'll get to kind of play around with in in these podcasts is the inquisitive journalistic let's get to the bottom of this versus the writer that has to hedge a little bit but is also (laughs) excited to to share how things have grown to the point that they have yeah it'll be really good and since I work as someone who interviews people about their experiences it's just kind Mm -hmm. of perfect really because I'm basically user experience testing ambition at this point right exactly (laughs) I'm gonna get to the details and analysis and it's gonna be really fun because I have plenty Mm -hmm. to say for those who like us are very keenly hyper excited about hyper fixated on ambition this will be a very fun experience because we're just going to get to really talk about every element of it and it's going to be really cool um i wanted to say i wrote down a note for myself Mm -hmm. to not forget about this but i wanted to talk about the name of the show and how that came to be um that's something that we'll talk about um in episodes as well is each the way we're structuring it is it's going to be like we'll talk about the episode title and we'll talk about how that came to be and how does that reflect the themes of an episode then we're going to talk about the synopsis that gets released and Mm. what 
Maddie and friends thought maybe it meant when it was first released versus now we know we have hindsight. So how does that play off now that we know what it's about? And then we'll get into the episode and we'll talk about things that happened, themes. We'll talk about the music. We'll do kind of what you'd expect of a recap. And then we'll talk about our own opinions. And then we will talk a little bit about foreshadowing too, like elements that we realize were planted very early on. But ambition as a title, which now feels like I cannot imagine it being called anything else. Like it's just so, it just works really well. And it's, I am a person, I'm a person that loves like a nice, crisp one word (laughs) title like i'm all about that i think it's good for the for a show or series it's just straight to the point um (laughs) but it took a a little bit to get to that it was like for a long time probably the first month and a half or so that we were brainstorming the show it was just called like we just called it triple a like spelled out triple a and i got to the point i think where we were starting to post that promo stuff and it was like s we have to pick a name because whatever we decide now we're going to be stuck with it. It's yeah. not going to be like episode titles where we've changed a few of those in the course of promo. But this is like, we have to decide and we got to stick with it. And I had mentioned ambition as an idea because it, I think thematically it covers a lot of things. It covers the arts. It covers being at a competitive school. It covers some of the characters and their different, you know, personalities. Yeah. It covers in a broader sense. I think a big theme of the show is like, figuring out what the hell you want to do with your life and that's someone's ambition you know it's like and it doesn't have to be an ambitious ambition but it's kind of that thing of finding your own interest and your own strength you know like characters like lucas and stuff like that go through that as well charlie and so i had this idea like that could be good and esther was like "Eh, i don't know (laughs) i don't really like it and then it was like it just took her a while that was like a couple days later i kind of mentioned again are we feeling about this? And she was like, oh, yeah, I guess that's fine. Sure, let's go with that. And then now it's like so set for both of us where it's yeah. like this was the perfect name. But at the time, it was very much like S kind of being like, okay, sure. She's I don't love particular. it, but let's go with it. She, she has opinions about names. That yes. And I remember when you were doing the original promo stuff and like the week two leading up to the first chapter or two and yeah it was actually even all the way through season one I would say that we still kind of would just call it triple a like when we were talking about it yeah before we had before you made the like official tumblr and things right yeah and I think that that's that still remains to both as kind of like a memento like a shell of that original (laughs) title idea Mm -hmm. that it's still it's like a fossil in a way but it also, I think, is just, it's good shorthand. It works still well as, you know, the big part of the show was AAA. The logo is the three A's. Mm-hmm. So it's like, it still works. And I think it, it is a perfect shorthand. Yeah. But as the title, it's like so funny that we look back on it and Esther's like, oh, I hated AAA. Like with the word triple, like written <laughs> out. <laughs> and, and I agree, because I think if we had gotten, you know, imagining season four of Ambition with the title AAA, it doesn't make sense anymore because they're no longer at triple A. Yeah, what would it have stood for anyway? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just I'm glad that we landed on a word that, that feels pretty representative, I would say. I think it has like a nice ring to it and it almost sounds it's gonna sound maybe weird, but it sounds almost like um like a perfume or something, you know, you can kind of imagine like a Mark Jacobs ambition sort of <laughs> yeah yeah um that's true and i think yeah. that makes it quite catchy i'm quite happy with how that turned out Good. um that it's kind of stuck that way we wanted to talk about this was kind of something that was also prompted um by a friend on instagram uh pearl she mentioned she wanted to know and we'll talk a lot about this i think just as these episodes go on but like kind of how the character developed especially coming oh. from an origin like fan fiction where it's like these you know, archetypes and these shells mm-hmm. existed from the original source material and how did that become what it is now? Mm-hmm. Um, I think that the biggest... I'll kind of try to keep it super brief because I don't want this episode to be a million minutes long. <laughs> I um, know, you could go on about this. I think so long. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know everything. Um, I think that the one who is probably for the most part, I would say this similar or the same or hasn't changed that much in terms of kind of the details would be Riley, you know, our protagonist, because she's very much 
the everyman and that is her intentional role is to be that vehicle that we get to go into this world with you know she's the normal one (laughs) amidst in season one especially Mm -hmm. amidst all of these very sharp Mm -hmm. characters and so she and she has that as well in the original source material i think that she you know, because it was a Disney Channel show and it was just a different kind of audience, I think that Riley kind of got a little bit of a bad rap yeah. in the original show of being, like, dumb or being naive or clueless. And it's like, obviously this Riley is not really that. I think we've kind of developed more into what were her insecurities yes. and what was she running from, what was she not confident in her arc has been a lot tied to shedding those insecurities and becoming more confident in herself and assertive and which we talk about a lot in season three because that's such a big part of her arc in season three but she for the most part i think in terms of being the central character being the everyman being the one who is this glue that brings all these different people together is still relatively the same Mm -hmm. i think just and this kind of is a gloss over for everything is it's a bit more serious. It's a bit more mature. It's a bit more you want. right. Is is a little deeper and a little more serious in terms of themes versus Gromit's World. It's it's a Disney Channel show. It's not meant to be serious, <laughs> and we kind of took those archetypes and those ideas. Yeah, I mean, and built on that. I think it it definitely builds on it partly because of you um, and Esther both sort of being writers, but also the way you sort of talked about it so much is that took those ideas that were in the original source and you dug so deep with them that it it took it more to these conceptual um insecurities and flaws and goals and and made those into the new characters rather than just sort of putting the original characters into new position and just having them react to it it was more about Right. Who was who was underneath all of that all along? Who those people would turn into as well? Right. Yeah. I think that too. I think you know we see that in terms as well as the characters who uh, the perfect example of this is Dylan and Asher, mm. right? Who in the in the source material <laughs> have like three lines. They're in there for like two minutes in one episode, and they are just Lucas and friends. And I had grown this kind of attachment to them theoretical ideas from when I had written my epic Girl Meets World fanfiction back in the day, which was Gravity on the Open Road. It was like a, this was my closing fanfiction of like how I thought their high school years would resolve. And in that, I just got to play with their characters a little bit. And I just like loved them. I was like, these are so fun. Like I, I have such a clear image of them in my head, which to that point, I think is, it's more like they're my characters because they literally only had names in the show and that was their whole thing. Um, but they just felt so clear to me and to take them into ambition originally I was just like hey can Lucas have like two best friends in the techies who are like his right hand Mm -hmm. guys and their boyfriends and they're just like there and us was like okay sure Mm -hmm. why not Um, and that has just completely developed because when you like look at these characters and they exist in the world together they start to you know, react to things and build their personalities. Mm-hmm. And I think it'll be interesting to talk about that a little bit because I think in early season one, Dylan and Asher are almost not really distinguishable from each other. They kind of, especially in the first half of the season, mm-hmm. the traits that we have become so familiar with of like, you know, Asher being very neat and being very put together and kind of being a little feral <laughs> and like all those things are not so much developed at that point. They're kind of just these ideas but i think that that kind of goes to show like as a story develops like these things become deeper and certain ideas rise to the surface like dylan and asher we'll talk about this like mid-season two when we talk about their special but they just kind of they rose to the surface and they were like we have more to tell like use us use us (laughs) so they are an example of that and i think the other big example of that is charlie (gasps) because when we first were outlining the show And we were like, we were like, here's Maya, here's Sparkle, here's Zay. Like we had all these things. We knew like, oh, Zay is going to be in this relationship with Charlie in season one. And that was like really it when we were working on season one was we're like, we know that he's the, he's the secret boyfriend later. Mm. But really it's so crazy to me that like Charlie has become in a way, I mean, you know that he's one of my favorite characters to write. And I think that he has just, there was so much there 
in that idea of this character of who is this person that is so full of compassion and so full of love and so it's such a sweet Mm -hmm. heart but they're hidden under all of this stuff and you see this person in the beginning of season one that is so not like the person that we come to know Mm -hmm. and i think that unpacking all those things then led to just I, I think what I think is so cool about him is that he really creates entire worlds in our show. The The Gardner family is an entire yeah. world of these characters that did not exist in the source material that are completely original. Haverford is a completely new world that we explore in season three. Charlie's moving around in season four, so we're going to be a lot of different. He just blossomed into this element in the show that's like, I cannot imagine it without him. Yeah. But when we were outlining season one, Back in the day, back in 2019, I think I could confidently say, like, we could have removed him and we would have been like, we don't need him. Oh, my God. We didn't. Wow. But back then, it was so different. Like, you just see how these things yeah. develop. I mean, now he basically feels like the third protagonist. That's a, that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, that's a hot take from me right now. <laughs> I mean, there we have it. I like it. I like it. Breaking news. Another uh, <laughs> brunette baby uh, protagonist. There you go. <laughs> There you go. You heard it here first. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, I mean, he <laughs> he was definitely, he and Dylan and Asher, I think, are the mains that kind of, like, were not necessarily thought of as mains when we were first outlining. Yeah. And then over time, developed in those roles. Like, I would say by the, by, I would say, maybe the Les Mis episode, like, 109, that was when at least I started to really be like, oh, like, there's some fun stuff to play with here. Mm-hmm. And then by the end of season one, it was like, okay, we really need to do character because there's so much to look at and so much to explore and that of course really was even further cemented if we, when we get into the zay and the charlie and how their romance has kind of become like the romance in terms of the way the show is structured and we'll talk more about that in the future but those three were definitely the ones where it was like they grew into the show and i think they expanded when the show expanded yeah. and kept going um yeah, I mean, and more more people as well coming in, in season four. I'm looking forward to yeah. getting to know. Um, yeah. Like Nigel and Jade. Nigel Yindra. and Jade and Yindra. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the same. They kind of, they're doing now what Dylan and Asher did in season two, yeah. which is kind of stepping into a larger role. Um, so it's, it's going to be really fun. Uh, but Riley was definitely... I think the most similar to what she had started as. And then Maya, as I mentioned, we had a completely different idea for her originally. And then I think it's partially just, I want to say, I have to admit, like an influence of Sabrina a little bit mm. because her personality is so vibrant and she, everything that she makes and everything that she does as we were, you know, looking through music and stuff, it's just like, oh, I would say, if I was going to talk about in reference to the original Torch Show, I would say that Maya is more of a sketch of Sabrina than a sketch of Girl Meets World Maya. I think that it's more the diva side that was kind of brought to the forefront. And she, I think in season one, we still explored a lot of the things about like, you know, single mother, absent father, being low income, like Mm -hmm. all of those elements were kind of what we started with in season one. And those were things that were explored in the original source material. But now I think of Maya, Maya is one of my favorite characters, um, especially to write. And I think that she's kind of this interesting vehicle of, I think of her as the representative of the show in that she Mm -hmm. is dramatic. She is vibrant. She is a little insane, but she has an emotional core. And I think that that is kind of a tangible view of what ambition is like, where it's dramatic and Mm. whimsical and all those things. And I think she kind of, represents what that is and with her if we did not have her in the show it would be a completely different show and i think it would not have the spark that it does because she kind of brings this this fun whimsical weird yes theater kid thing to it (laughs) it brings an energy and she also plays against riley and farkle in really important ways yes so Yes. Yeah. And she's, she's, that's so true. She's so different from the rest of our main ensemble in that she's not, she really is kind of the dream. Like yes. she's like, I know what I care about, but she has her soft spots. And I think it's, it's been really fun to explore that. And I will say, I, we need to come up with like a little phrase of like, oh, here's Maggie signaling that you need to pay attention. But <laughs> I will say that that, that role for her 
in her overall arc in the whole series will be explored Ooh. because how does that change when the circumstances change? Um, cause it's easy to be that way in the safe space of triple a, but you know, how does that change when everything is different around you and you're in the real world? Oh. Um, <laughs> very intrigued. So she definitely has that. And I'd like, I would, I would be completely understand if people that were like big Maya stands, like of the original Sword of shield came and read ambition and this isn't like Maya at all. Like I'd be like, I no, you're that's, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> because she definitely is something that kind of became its own character. Um, and I think Zay, the thing about Zay in the original show is that he really did not have a character beyond oh. comic relief. Like, I'm sorry to say, <laughs> um, but he, you know, so we got to really play with this idea of like, it, there's this other diva. We've got the three divas and there's one who, is super talented and super driven, but is a little more emotionally grounded. Mm. And what does that look like? And how does that role play in? Um, and I think he has that really interesting thing of the other two divas have their own things going on. But I think Zay has this interesting conflict of what kind of the conflict of the show is, which is, yeah. you know, yeah. your dream versus your emotional community. Yes. And for him, like, like, the other two have pieces of that. Farkle has his own version of that. But for Zay, I think it's that thing of coming back to, not to talk about Zay and Charlie, but, like, <laughs> this idea of so much of their conflicts, yes, stems from the internalized homophobia and all that kind of stuff, but also stems from, I, we, I want you to pursue this thing. I'm holding you back. I have to let you go so you can do the thing you're meant to do. And I think that yeah. that's the conflict for them that they kind of represent that Zay really represents as a character is how far do you go for the dream and how, what do you compromise for that? And he's constantly struggling with that because I think more than Farkle and Maya, he values his community and his friends and his emotional support mm. more intrinsically than they do. And that's his big struggle is how much do I sacrifice of either or mm -hmm. to do what I know I'm meant to do, but still get to have love and get to have friends and get to be able to feel like i contribute to a community so that's i don't and i don't know where that really came from i think that's another example of that was not really pulled from the show because there was not much to work with to begin with yeah. but i think it was just this kind of idea of what's the story piece that's missing here what do we want to explore in this theme and that's he fit that perfectly so then, of course, um, I will i will save um <laughs> lucas and isa for last because there's an interesting little piece for them Ooh. but Farkle, um, he, I think there are pieces from his original character. The main thing is just the theatricality, because even in Girlmates World, like Farkle as a character is very dramatic and very, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think a little, a little bit spoiled, a little bit entitled, yes. like all They're these kind of, of things that, right. Um, and we just kind of, I just took that idea and it was like, well, let's theater kid that. Like, yeah. let's make it even worse because he's a theater <laughs> kid. Um, but then, you know, we wanted to play into these. We clearly, since that was the flashpoint for us, we clearly knew, like, there's so much going on to the surface mm -hmm. there that's contributing to this. And that's both the black sheep syndrome in his family that's feeling inferior in his own ways to other people and compensating. Yes. It's the literal mental illness that, as we know, in season three, he... Is diagnosed with bipolar disorder and that was again something that we knew from the beginning like we were like he has a he has a disorder that is causing this but we're not going to figure that out until yeah. later but we were very conscious about we'll talk about this as we go through the episodes but us being like this is a moment of mania this is a moment of depression yeah. like these are moments that are reflected in that so we knew all these elements were there but then he really has just kind of grown into i think from that initial idea of kind of hyperactive theater kid <laughs> to what he is now is really just we've said this before but he and riley are the two different protagonists of the show yeah. and it's that riley is more the literal tangible protagonist where again she's the everyman she's our entry into the show she's kind of our viewpoint whereas farkle is i think the narrative protagonist of the show where his arc is the one that is representative and emotional and tied to what the themes of the show are in the most direct way like I you know I mentioned with Zay Zay having that battle between community and the dream Farkle has it as well but his is a little more 
I mean, we've seen it in a lot of his monologues, you know, like, I want a team, I don't want to do this alone, I don't want to sacrifice my team, like, him kind of realizing that letting people in and community is not weakness, it's not going to make you lose your dream, it's a way to support yourself with your dream, that's such a big theme of the show as a whole, and I think every character reflects that. I love that. that. But he's he's the vehicle, like, he's the one that is really carrying that arc. So he and Riley, they are, there are two that are the two, if I had to say like, oh, these are the main characters. We have an ensemble, but those two are narratively the top tier. <laughs> and then everybody else is like right underneath them. <laughs> so many. It's, so. A, it's an ensemble of ensembles, really. Yes. And there's, we can definitely talk about um, balancing mm. that because it is, uh, it can be challenging. We have to. Our last two here, the reason I saved Lucas and uh, Isidora for last, is because they, I think, are the reason that ambition exists. Mm. And the reason that I say that is because Isidora was Esther's favorite character from Girl Meets yes. World. And Lucas, as many people know, was my favorite character from Girl Meets World. Oh. And we both felt the writing of them in the original source material was, how do I say this nicely? <laughs> Underserved. Um, a little vague yes. uh, it, it opened them up to a lot of criticism mm-hmm. from people within the fandom the original fandom mm-hmm. because i felt like they they just were never given their time mm-hmm. or their due i think even though lucas was a main character like first season episode one build mm-hmm. main character if you look at the three seasons of the show it's like where did he go nowhere really yeah. he was just there so true and then was caught in an unfortunate love triangle but (laughs) to me it's like i just but i saw like so much of i think myself in him a little bit and this idea of like being this my the original lucas like being a perfectionist and being the person who wants to be there for their friends Mm -hmm. and protect their friends and like his weird thing with his dad where he was calling him sir and i was like who calls their dad sir like there's something weird going on there like all these little details, yes, exactly. I, I dug, 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 dug really deep yes. because I just really liked this character. Um, and then going into, and Esther did similar things with Issa, where it was like Esther, as someone who is autistic, seeing a character who is autistic, of course, means so much. But while it's nice that the show did include that, it left some things to be desired mm-hmm. and it wasn't perfect representation ever. And so I latched onto that as well and then dug 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 in her own way and so we were coming into this world of ambition with both of those very clear bias um where we just loved these characters and i think that that thankfully has not changed i think it's improved as the show has gone on of like we really do put a lot of care into every member of the ensemble mm-hmm. but definitely going into it at first like one of the reasons if you look at season one like who's got these storylines mm-hmm. it's isadora and it's lucas yeah. and that's partially because they were so special to us and mm-hmm. we were taking that initial original fondness into these new characters and these new ideas so that's kind of why they exist in a different place mm-hmm. on my mind in the first season mm-hmm. is because we were it was really kind of their this was like we're like this is our justice is we're going to give these characters the space to really be fully fleshed out characters with fears and ambitions and all that kind of stuff but i think also just we love them and we wanted to see an actual story yeah. given to them and i think like the group the chat that we have together which is we were do all of our outlining like when we're having conversations about it and then we put it in actual notes mm-hmm. um is that the photo for that when we first made it was a manipped photo of peyton and cc so it was like lucas and isa Okay. sitting together like in the booth like Aww. a selfie and it has been that photo it is still that photo Aww. three years later and i think that that's like the core of it's us like that <laughs> it was us bringing that together um so they're just very important to us but i think i will save discussing a lot of isa for when we have s come on the show sometime which we will we're planning to to get her in here a couple times but she can talk a lot more about what she wanted from that change and the development of Issa's character and all that kind of stuff. But yeah. I know that definitely it was the thing of, we knew that she was driven and she was, you know, kind of the bad bitch who was like the director and had everything under control seemingly. Mm-hmm. But then of course had all this personal emotional stuff going mm-hmm. on on the surface that the directing thing was almost compensating for. And none of that, 
you would get from the original source material is not like that no. at all. So yeah, I I would love to to get us here to talk about that because I think she would just have such interesting things to say. Definitely. Um, but and I'll admit too, I think that we in general do a lot of the writing together, but for the most part, we kind of have this understanding. S is taking care of the Issa stuff. I'm taking care of the Lucas stuff. Like we still kind of have that divide yeah. a little bit. Um, it's because we just know like that's their baby and they're gonna take care of it. And it's gonna be fine. Um, so for me with Lucas, he, <laughs> it's kind of funny because when this first started. I still had other Girl Meets World alternate universes going on. And I would always say, like, Ambition Lucas is kind of like original Lucas's worst nightmare. Like, he's <laughs> everything that he hates about himself <laughs> broadcasted. Um, and the reason I say that is because, you know, when we first meet him, you know, it's what? It's with his little switchblade and his little grumpy ass <laughs> black clothes and, like, being very, like, it's funny because I've, I've said this before that Lucas as an archetype yeah. in the first season is a character that I would not like as a viewer. Yeah. I hate like bad boy characters <laughs> who are just like assholes. And the thing is like, we know Lucas is not like that, yeah. but if I was watching a show and I didn't trust the writers mm-hmm. and I didn't know the writers and I saw him in the pilot, I'd be like, this man <laughs> is annoying as hell and I don't like him. And I think over time, like, if I got to, you know, episode seven, you know, the first season of the the Techie Revolt and, like, what's his backstory and what's going on, like, I would warm up to him over time. Yeah. But I really, I just know, like, I would not like him at first. And I think that that's kind of interesting is that I created this character that I love, but I know I wouldn't like, which I think is an interesting kind of just proof of, like, you need to let mm-hmm. characters grow and develop. Yeah. Um, but even still, there's big differences in that. Like, with Lucas, it's yes, he's kind of an asshole and he's a little troublemaker and Mm -hmm. he's not very friendly, but he's, he respects women and he is polite to people that deserve to be polite towards. And I think that a lot of his kind of scruffiness in the first season is just from this thing of no one, you know, really taking care of him in a way, you know, he's been on his own for you know, his mom is in the situation that they're in and is not a great mom in her own right anyway because she didn't really want to be a mom. And then there's the Kenneth of it all, the dad, mm. and those factors. I think that's something that Esther and I talk about all the time is like the situations and factors that someone is living with, how is that going to make them into the person that they are? And that's what we're coming into a lot with them season one is that's the Lucas we're seeing is the Lucas that has been basically scrapping on his own yeah. for... 16 years of his life and is not a great social he's still not a great socializer yeah. but he's way like you know worn down a little bit and has been a little domesticated as they all kind of joke <laughs> but he he's never been a great socializer and then if you put a feral element on top of it, it's like yeah that's what you're gonna get is this little bitch <laughs> who's setting off the fire alarm because everybody's being annoying so as is his right just taking those original yeah exactly <laughs> um and he too even back when uh, a long time ago, when I was doing spec scripts for Girl Meets World for season, a theoretical season four, I had a musical episode in that, and in that episode, original Lucas did not sing because I just have this thing in my head of like Lucas is a talentless, adorable boy, <laughs> and he can't dance and he can't sing, and so when we came into Ambition, I was like, Lucas is talentless and can't sing, <laughs> and um. Esther was like, okay, sure, because he was a techie, so it didn't matter. But it's been kind of funny that originally in season one, I was like, Lucas will never sing. He's never going to sing. He's never going to dance. That's his role is to be the person who is in this school, but does not do anything that the school yeah. does, which is still true. He still represents that role. Yes. But now it's like, as you know, it's like, well, he, he sang a little bit in season one. And then he did a couple before in season two. It's like, I have bet that rule. Yeah. to the max and now it's kind of like we use it the fact that he still is very much a character that does not perform at all to the breath that the other characters do is kind of a, a narrative device where it's like if he's singing about something mm-hmm. whether it's in real life or in his head having his dramatic monologues in his head like it's because that moment is important yes like there's a line he has his line in season one episode something we'll get to it eventually where he says to they're they're talking shit about him on the the instagram and dylan's like are you okay like this is harsh are you really sure you're fine 
And he says, when I care about something, you'll know. Yeah. And that's kind it's of, true. that is the kind of mantra that I use in writing stuff like that for him is like, I want viewers to be able to know based on what he's doing or what he's saying or the way that he's reacting that this is a so we'll talk about that as as the season goes on but he definitely has evolved from he's evolved from he will never sing to well he'll sing when it's important to the yeah i mean (laughs) the great thing is that it shows that his his vulnerable side and his ability to open up is is growing and it's a great way Mm -hmm. to show that is that he actually ends up taking part a lot more right and that's it's fun too because they're kind of lore to the show as we understand it and this will be a really great our podcast will be a good vehicle too for people that like to kind of just know backstory details that maybe are not brought up in the show or haven't been brought up yet is we talk about that a lot and i i I feel so bad because i'm like there's people out there who love this show that just don't know Mm -hmm. some of the stuff that i've talked about so this is gonna be a good vehicle for that but um with lucas it's this thing of the backstory for him is that he, as we know now, you know, he's not talentless. Like when he picks up a guitar and sings, it's not awful. Mm-hmm. He, if he had been fostered, you know, he would never be a Fargo Mingus. He'd never be a Zay, but he's not it's, awful. It's, it's, but kind of his, the reason he is, right, exactly. <laughs> the reason he's become so anti-music is because when he first arrived in triple a in freshman year for what well, was his second freshman year but in freshman year for our class he you know was like okay this is my fresh start like i'm away from my dad i'm gonna make the best of this and so for the first couple days like he was not the lucas that they have come yeah. to know by the time we get to season one but he you know was trying to participate and little mr rat child farkle mm-hmm. mangus of you know 13 years old criticized him in his Frankel Minkus way and because of this like that thing of vulnerability and being criticized and everybody being kind of bitchy triple a Lucas was like okay you know what you want you're creating your own monster and he put the snap back on and he said fuck music and became the monster that they have been dealing with for two years after that yeah so basically if they had been nice to him and had not criticized him Mm -hmm. so harshly we could have avoided a lot of the angst that we came into in season yeah. one, but it's just, it's that kind of thing of if you're, if you're cruel to someone, you reap what you sow. Mm-hmm. So Lucas is a little bit of that, but he could have been great. He could have been. Right, no. no, he couldn't have, but <laughs> he, <laughs> it was not out of the question. And maybe at some point we'll see some credence Ooh. to that. So many hints and little intriguing tidbits. So yeah, that's that's kind of the how it all came to be and where things started. And as we go on this journey, we're gonna we're gonna dig into a lot more. Mm-hmm. But hopefully that was fun and people get something out of Surely. this. I think it's gonna be <laughs> at least we will get something out of it. Just getting to come talk to each other for yeah. hours every <laughs> other Saturday. It's just gonna be so nice. I'm really looking forward to it, and <laughs> the fact that other people might be able to enjoy our uh, discussions and explanations of things and questioning. I feel like I can I can hopefully get in touch with um, the questions that other people might be thinking, and we can yes. also do episodes where we sort of field questions to other people and answer them like a like a Mm -hmm. big block of cheese day sort of (laughs) yes uh we're coming from maddie had converted me to watching the Mm -hmm. west wing in this past year it was like the fastest i'd ever watched a seven season tv show um and then she also i am not a podcast podcast, but she got me to start listening to the west wing weekly which I think was a little bit of an inspiration for this, which is just mm-hmm. coming together with someone who was involved in the show and someone who was an avid consumer of the show and letting those two things interact as, mm-hmm. as recapping um, goes. So yeah, I guess what we can talk about our plan, what we want this to look like moving forward. Um, so basically our plan is to go through each episode and that will be kind of the structure for each episode we are going to hit on things we're going to do some episodes for summer we're going to probably do 
just bits and pieces if we come up with different ideas that we want to look into, we can do that. Um, but basically, our post schedule plan is this one is being posted. As I say this, I'm speaking into the future. <laughs> um, it's being posted on Saturday the 15th. And what we're trying to do, both for my sanity and for a little bit of fun <laughs> for viewers, is we're really we're sticking to the theme of Ambition Saturday. So these are going to be airing, you know, Ambition airs every two weeks. So on the week that Ambition is not airing, we will be dropping a new podcast Ooh. episode. So it's going to be kind of like every Saturday, if you want it, there's Ambition content for you to munch on and enjoy. So the first, this is like our little intro episode. And then the first official episode of starting our recaps is going to premiere on January 29th on the U.S. Hemisphere, <laughs> um, January 29th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. So you can mark your calendars, everybody. Get ready. And if you live anywhere else in the world, particularly in the Southern Hemisphere, on the New Zealand side of things, <laughs> it will be 30th. Yes, it's Ambition Sundays for you guys. <laughs> and where will we be posting such things? Tell the listeners. So I believe we are going to kind of have two different options. We're going to be posting on, there is an official Ambition YouTube account uh, that we mainly use for if you don't have Spotify and you want to follow the music, we put music on there. Our amazing beta Natalia does oh. that and she keeps track of that. So I'm thinking we don't use it to post anything. We'll post these episodes on the Ambition YouTube account. Um, so it'll be available on YouTube and hopefully in a Drive folder, a Google Drive folder that people nice. can access where it will have all yeah. of the episodes. So there's a couple different ways to check it out. Someday we might try to put it on Spotify, but Spotify is confusing. We don't We're not doing that right that. now, but maybe. <laughs> Monday. Right, exactly. Um, so that will be where the episodes are found. And in terms of contacting us, so as most people probably know, there are existing social medias that we have we have the tumblr which is source we have the instagram which is the ambition source and we also with this youtube would have a youtube comment section that people can use my only request would be if you have something that you specifically want to send to the podcast of things mention that this is for the podcast because i get different things for different elements yes. of ambition uh, maybe in the future if we want to make a you know some sort of hub that's for specifically the podcast we can do that but for now yeah. that would be the way to do it is the the instagram the tumblr or in terms of the episodes themselves i mean the youtube section is often an evil place but in this case it will be the perfect place to easily we're gonna correct. convert youtube to being a nice place <laughs> by the yeah. skin of our teeth and our final <laughs> our last <laughs> words um so yeah that's if if you're excited about this, let us know. Since we are going to be doing the pilot, if there's any questions you guys have about the pilot, about mm -hmm. the reading experience, the writing experience, if you're going to read along with us, let us know. That'll be very fun um, to have Ooh, people yeah. reading along in our reread. But yeah, feel free to hit us up. And hopefully we will really get into the swing of things it. with this yeah. as we figure it out. <laughs> so yeah, I guess okay. that's... We can sign off. We haven't come up with a sign off yet, but yes. it will come to be. As right it now, comes to I'm be. thinking everyone should stay safe, drink some water, um, yes. listen to some music, and um, stay tuned. Yes, that sounds good to me. Especially stay safe because yes. life's crazy. It's, so it's still crazy. But we have ambition, and that will keep us going. So thank you for listening. Thank you. We will be. Checking in with y'all in a couple weeks with a new episode. So stay posted. Stay tuned. <laughs> All right. Bye.